four and a half inches of rain in the old rain gauge here at 3,200 feet over this last series of storms since last Sunday. Persistent rain here in the springtime uh, is continuing to slow things down at Oroville. Uh, the inflows right now at the moment are temporarily exceeding outflows and the lake level is kind of stuck around 862 feet. Outflows are at 35,000 CFS cubic feet per second and inflows are varying anywhere from 28 to 43,000 CFS. Why are they only running the spillway at 35,000 CFS? I think they want to minimize the number of cycles of turning on and off the spillway. Every time they cycle that spillway on and off, more erosion damage is caused than just by continuing to run the spillway continuously, keeping that water flying over at the edge. My name's Juan Brown and you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. Improving weather conditions after the weekend, to, which will help in lowering the lake level in Oroville. Get through this wet spring period. But more importantly, breaking news published in the Los Angeles Times, we now have a preliminary independent report on the cause of the spillway failure at Oroville. Published by the Center for published by the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management out of UC Berkeley, authored by uh, R.G. Bea. This is an independent report. This is not, Mr. Bea, a retired civil engineer, is not on the board of consultants that's actually doing the forensics on this, that's been hired to do the forensics at Oroville. He is uh, doing his own independent research paper, and I think it's a pretty good source of information. So let's go inside and take a quick look at what Mr. Bay has published here and it gives a pretty clear indication of what the actual forensics investigators are going to be looking at and paints a pretty clear picture of what the chain of events was that led to the spillway failure at Oroville. This is going to be a quick and dirty presentation. I don't have a lot of time for fancy graphics or anything like that at this moment. So let's dive right in here and see what, what's going on. I'll give you this link in the comment section down below, but here's the uh, LA Times story. They didn't have much time to review this <laughs> report either. They just give a little one paragraph summary and just publish the report in its entirety. RJ Bea, Center for Catastrophic Risk Management out of Berkeley, published yesterday, preliminary root causes analysis of failures of the gated spillway. The Center for Catastrophic Risk Management out of UC Berkeley studies has studied several major events and come up with their own independent reports in the past, including the Deepwater Horizon disaster and Hurricane Katrina. Remember too how we've said this is going to be a historic event and fundamentally change the way we maintain and operate uh, aging infrastructure going forward. That's exactly the conclusion that Mr. Bea makes in this report. He's got a lot of great pictures and notes in here that we'll take a look at, but let's go back and look at his summary. And this is some great stuff he's got right here. Now, I don't know if this is the actual engineering drawings for Oroville or he derived or or these are his drawings or where he got these drawings from, but these he answers a lot of important questions that we've had all along during this during this episode, during this whole spillway incident. And this being already published in the Los Angeles Times, I'm not concerned about this being part of the uh, critical engineering infrastructure information. Besides, this is just about rocks and rebolt and rebar. It's, it's simply not information that, that's, that is very critical from an intelligence point of view, um, but is very critical in the redesign of this new spillway. Mr. Bea starts out with a very good um, analysis on the chain of events that goes all the way back to the original design over 50 years ago and some of our assumptions that we've seen just looking at this disaster unfold. The spillway base slab thickness of, is of insufficient thickness. The rebar placement and size and diameter is, is insufficient. The preparation of the bedrock down below was inadequate and the anchoring of the spillway to the bedrock below was also inadequate. 
He then goes on to point out the inadequate maintenance of the facility and inadequate drainage of the facility. By the way, here's the letter showing the actual forensics team board of consultants that's going to do the actual investigation on the Orville Spillway failure. Mr. Bia is not on this list. He is an independent engineer consultant producing his own report. Plenty of good references in his report. Now let's dive into some of the some of the pictures he's he's uh, uncovered. It helps explain this. This is January of 2017. He's pointing out the drains, the wall drains in the spillway, the blue circles indicating proper drainage, and right here where it subsequently failed, there's no water draining from those drain pipes. He also points to the vegetation growing very closely, possibly getting in there just like your sewer at home, clogging your drain pipes with the roots. In this picture, he's indicating that erosion was already taking place underneath the spillway even before it failed. Here he indicates that the amount of water coming out of the wall drains indicates a lot of water underneath the spillway that shouldn't be there. Here's another view of that. Now this is interesting. This shows how the drains work in a herringbone pattern. We've heard of that. I think the angle of this is a little bit exaggerated. Uh, the clay pipes move the water underneath the spillway and then drain out the side of the walls. Okay, here's that expansion joint detail. This is critical. You put a 15 inch slab, you put a six inch pipe in a 15 inch slab that leaves only nine inches of concrete over the over the pipe. Expansion joint. Everybody knows what an expansion joint is, right? Every time you drive over a concrete bridge and you can hear your tires kathump, 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 that's the expansion joint. Concrete structures need to expand and contract with the heat. And in order to do that, to prevent them from cracking, they got to have an expansion joint in it to allow for this expansion due to heating and contracting due to cooling. Same thing in your sidewalk, why they put that grid pattern in your sidewalk around your house. Other points he makes about the detail here is the rebar. There's only one layer of rebar near the top surface of the spillway. There's no rebar requirement on the bottom portion of the spillway. So as he looks very close at the failed point here, here's the six inch pipe with the even larger bell end and there is the crack right where the concrete is thinnest at the bell end of that pipe the wide end of that pipe the thinnest part of the concrete here you can see the plastic wrap that's part of that structure at the bell end of these pipes the diameter can be as much as 10 inches resulting in only four to six inches of concrete left over the bell end of these pipes. The wide end. The bell end, of course, is where you slip the two pipes together, where the one pipe slips over the other, the sections of pipe. So here he's showing in an as-built drawing, they went ahead and added these load transfer bars during the construction over the expansion joint. Here he's indicating cracks on the spillway associated with the drain pipes where the concrete is thin. Here he's pointing out the good rock versus the bad rock, the weathered rock, the brown colored rock which is much softer and more crumbly versus the blue colored rock that's been recently exposed. That's, that's a competent, <laughs> that's a good rock to anchor to by comparison. A lot of discussion on our uh, YouTube page about cavitation. Well, this is a classic case of cavitation uh, damage right here. Again, not the, uh, not the primary cause of the failure, but certainly doesn't help. And as you can see, it eroded enough to expose that top layer of rebar. Cavitations where you see a little bit of air getting underneath the water and that 
and that air bubble keeps smashing down or the, the air bubble forms and then it smashes down and collapses, forms and collapses, forms and collapses. Every time it crushes down on the concrete like that, it causes cavitation damage. Very common on um, boat propellers as well. Another look at the layer of rebar on the top of the slab and there too. Okay, this is interesting. This is how they actually get the slab anchored to the rock. And this is how you're going to prevent the slab from slipping at the expansion joints. And the call out for these, for this anchor rebar is five feet, embedded five feet into the rock, number 11 rebar. That's about 1.4 inch diameter rebar. The rebar in the top slab is called out here as number five rebar. That's five eighths inch rebar at 12 inches on center. So a 12 inch grid. And down here they do make mention of a wire fabric square down here around the um, anchoring rebar. Okay, here he's got it called out. 10, by, 10 foot by 10 foot grid. So every 10 feet you get an anchor rebar. Now this is the job today of what the anchor bolts are doing. And here's a good example of the anchor rebar still embedded in the bedrock below, the busted bedrock below, and the spillway completely separated from the anchor bar. Pulled away. So Mr. Bea's research is indicating that this failure was right along one of those thin drain pipe lines. Here he's showing where that pipe would have run. Right there at the failure point. He also points out these voids underneath where water can get underneath there and weaken the whole structure. Here in this, here in this picture we can see where the pipe was. And that's pretty clear evidence to me that this failure did occur right along one of the clay drainage pipes. And these pieces of rebar sticking out may very well be the as-built sections of rebar added to a expansion joint to prevent separation. That's why they're so short and cut off uniformly. They are not a part of the continuous rebar, which of course does not continue over an expansion joint. Why does concrete need rebar? Concrete is strong in compression as you smash down on it, but it's weak in tension as you can easily pull it apart. Rebar adds the tension strength that concrete needs. By putting a layer of rebar in the top layer, you're only adding tension strength to the top layer of concrete with no rebar in the bottom layer. That's allowing that bottom layer of concrete to flex and move, especially if you've got water underneath there. Now you can see these cracks in historic Google Earth views, but note how the cracks line up with the herringbone pattern of the drain pipes underneath the spillway. Here's an even better view of the herringbone pattern of cracks following the drain pipes in the spillway. And that tree and vegetation that should have been removed years ago plugging up the drain pipes with their roots. Here's a uh, illustration of how a expansion joint should be done with this added footing right here to prevent the lower section from separating. Drain pipe, footing, expansion joint. And note too, <laughs> it looks like they're showing rebar, continuous rebar on both the top and bottom. So again this brings up the whole issue is that it met the design standards of the time but it's certainly inadequate by today's design standards. In additional breaking news, the DWR awards the contract for the spillway repair to Kiwit Construction, winning bid of $275 million plus change. DWR engineer estimates are already being revised from $220 million to $231 million. Who's going to pay for it all is still uh, up for debate. After all, it's going to end up being me and you. The idea of passing these water costs onto the water customers downstream of Oroville is probably not going to fly, and I suspect that Governor Brown is going to have to go back to President Trump and ask for another handout. To pay for the Oroville spillway disaster. 
So there's a lot more great detail in this report. I hope you check out the link and check it out for yourself. Um, and I hope that this report gives you a preliminary understanding of what the inspectors are going to be looking at, what the independent board of consultants are going to be looking at as far as the chain of events that caused the failure of the Oroville Spillway. Stay tuned!